Before we get into the nuances of adding Roman numerals to names, I want us to start at the other end of things and take some names and turn them into formulas. And there's two basic steps here, one of which is writing charges, and the other of which is crisscrossing and reducing. And all this crisscrossing and reducing is, is a way to find least common multiples and make charges cancel out. So if you're wondering why we're going to start in this order, it's because this idea here, this crisscross idea, is going to be what we use to figure out the Roman numerals when we're taking formulas and turning them into names. So in this basic idea here, we need to get the charges. And in a case like this, all of those charges are on the periodic table. So we're, we'll work rather quickly. Lithium is a one plus group one of the periodic table. Bromine is a one minus group 17 of the periodic table. And then we can just crisscross and reduce. So what is the least common multiple of one and one? It's one. So I'll need and again, we're ignoring the charge. We're only worried about the magnitude, a one. So it's lithium bromide, all right? Then something like magnesium chloride, we have Mg, group two of the periodic table is a two plus. Chloride from chlorine, which is group 17 of the periodic table, and I'm gonna make that a little bit cursive, one minus. The least common multiple as we look at it, what do, what do two and one have in common? Well, two, two times what? is two, well, a one, and one times what is two, a two. And again, I don't really recommend you do it that way. It's much easier to just crisscross and reduce. It's the same math, MgCl2, all right? Looking at the next one here, barium oxide, this is where that reducing comes into play. Barium, group two of the periodic table is a two plus. Oxide from oxygen, group 16 of the periodic table is a two minus. When we crisscross these, We'll put a 2 there and a 2 there, but that would give us, and I'm going to take an intermediate color here, BA2O2. You may remember that ionic compounds always use the empirical formula, and that's the lowest whole number ratio of things. So when you end up with a situation like this, you need to then reduce it one step more to lowest whole number ratios. In this case, that would be ba Oh, all right. So keep an eye out for a situation like that. And sometimes things look a little messy, but they are what they are, right? It's the lowest whole number ratio we can get. So if you look at aluminum, group 13 is a three plus. Sulfide from sulfur, group 16 is a two minus. We're going to crisscross and reduce. Our two is gonna go right there. Our three is gonna go right there. Again, we're ignoring the plus and minus part. You get Al2S3. And I would like to point out once again, least common multiple that we're dealing with here is six. Two times three gets us that six. Three times two gets us the six. And the plus six and the minus six cancel out. Same up here. So one, two plus, one, two minus cancels out, which is the same as two, two minuses and two, two pluses. While we are brushing up on this particular skill, I'd like to take a look at some problems with polyatomic ions. The biggest trick to taking polyatomic ion names and turning them into formulas is recognizing the polyatomic ions. It's useful to have some list of polyatomic ions available, but it's even more useful if you can just remember them. But as we look at this, some names we need to watch for, one of the, the shortcuts or one of the cheats that I've thought of is a lot of times you are used to spotting the names of chemical elements, like potassium is an element. Nitrate is not an element, right? Nitrogen is an element or in a compound, it might be nitride. Aluminum is an element. Carbonate is not an element. Again, you could either learn your list, use your list for every single word and be like, okay, nitrate, or you can just know, all right? Ammonium, looks like aluminum at a glance, but is not. That's not an element. Chlorine, as chloride, is. Ammonium, once again, not an element. And phosphate, not an element, and nitrite, with a very subtle distinction between nitrate, and we have calcium, aluminum, potassium, and chlorine that are on the periodic table, they're elements. So this would be a step I would suggest, spot your polyatomic ions right away. And then it's just a matter of doing exactly what we did previously, which is write the charges, crisscross and reduce. The only thing you kind of need to watch for is um, parentheses with these polyatomic ions. And you'll see I kind of have a suggestion for that as well. Potassium. K, group one of the periodic tables, a one plus. Nitrate is the polyatomic ion, NO3, and it has a one minus charge. 
now it doesn't hurt to put in a parenthesis right now. You may want to hold off, but I think for a lot of people, it's useful right now to just declare. I'm going to put a parenthesis around this so that I don't screw it up later. And you don't need it. It doesn't mean you have to write it. So I've got that one, and that's going to go outside the parenthesis. And I've got that one. Remember, I'm not worried about the plus or the minus, and that's going to go right there. So our formula, since I have one here, there's no need for that parenthesis. K N O three potassium nitrate. Similarly, as we look at the aluminum carbonate, aluminum is a three plus. It's in group thirteen on the periodic table. Carbonate is CO three two minus. Again from our list there. What I recommend is just throw a parenthesis around your polyatomic ion to start off, and then when you crisscross, you don't have to worry about these things right here. You don't get to change the formula of the polyatomic ion. In fact, I often tell my students, like, it's just something under your finger. You're not changing what's there. You're changing what's outside of that finger over there. Um, so we got our three, put it outside. We've got our two, put it over there. And so you end up with Al2, CO3, and we have three of those, all right? So we have three carbonates. We don't have C3O9, whatever that compound is. We have three of those things, all right? And so again, when you're thinking of that, it's three of whatever's there under my finger. It doesn't matter. There's three of that piece, all right? Don't think that you can multiply that in because we have three independent entities there, those polyatomic ions. Ammonium chloride, again, we need to know that ammonium is NH4. That's one of our polyatomic ions. It's a 1 plus. And chloride from chlorine, Cl group 17, is a 1 minus. It does not hurt to preemptively put some parentheses around the polyatomic ion. One goes down there. One goes down there. We don't need the parentheses if there's just a 1. And we have NH4Cl. Would it hurt or would it be wrong to put the parenthesis in? No, but it is more writing, and I think that's its own hurdle. <clears throat> Ammonium, once again, NH4, it's a one plus. Phosphate is PO4 with a three minus. And if you're saying, where did that come from? The answer, once again, is a list of polyatomic ions is handy, right? Both of those things are polyatomic ions. So I'll start out, whether it's necessary or not, with parentheses around both of them. I'm going to take this three, bring it down there. I'm going to take the one and bring it down there. And it turns out we do need that parenthesis on the ammonium. So we have NH4, three of those, but I don't need around the phosphate, PO4. Our last one here, calcium nitrite. You do have to be careful. Calcium Ca2+, plus, right? Group 2 of the periodic table. Nitrite. Be very, very careful because these endings make a big difference. So nitrite is NO2 with a 1 minus charge versus nitrate, which is NO3 with a 1 minus charge. Looking at our polyatomic ion here, I'm going to put my parentheses. Do I actually need it? Doesn't matter. We can always not write it later. 2 goes down there, and 1 goes down there. So we end up with CaNO2, 2. I would like to add one more example just so we can see the reducing part of crisscross. Let's say we have something like strontium oxalate. Again, my general strategy, if you haven't memorized that sheet, is kind of pay attention to what looks like it's an element and what doesn't. And that might be a tip off. You have a polyatomic ion, and then worst case scenario, you can look that up on a chart somewhere. In this particular case, strontium, group two of the periodic table, is a two plus. And then the oxalate polyatomic ion is C2O4, two minus. <clears throat> and just as a very, very, very side note, you may ask why is that polyatomic ion not reduced? Because, this C2O4 is not held together by ionic bonds. Remember, a polyatomic ion is a covalently bonded group of atoms with a net charge. So that is the molecular formula for C2O4. It just happens to have two extra electrons. So just an interesting side note there. Parenthesis, parenthesis. And then when we bring those charges down, you'll notice we have a two and a two. And you could write that as some intermediate. I'll just write it to cross it out. So we get like, I'll put it over here, 
SR2, C204, 2, but you can quickly see that that 2 and that 2 are going to cancel out. And it, it's, it's worth seeing because we're not messing with C204 and just putting your finger over it, it's like I have two of whatever is under my finger, I have two strontiums and I have two of whatever that is, so I can't change the stuff that's under there, that's set in stone, I can only change the stuff that's on the outside. So we would end up with SRC204, and that is strontium oxalate for these purposes. The last step in names to formulas then is going to be names to formulas using transition metals. And you can spot these every single time for the names, almost, when they have that Roman numeral there. And there are two kind of exceptions, and I'll mention those at the bottom right here. One that always comes up is silver. Silver always has an oxidation state of one. So you don't ever see somebody put silver one, whatever the compound is. It's just silver whatever the compound is. I guess we can make one up here. Let's just say um, chloride. Then you would just call this silver chloride. And then if you have something like zinc is another very common one, you'd never see zinc two chloride. Chances are you'd see zinc chloride. But I'm more than willing to encourage you to forget all of that information and just put Roman numerals on every single thing that you see on the area of the periodic table that we have dedicated to our transition metals. And I'll say that again in slow-mo. If it's in this highlighted area, just put a Roman numeral on it. If you put a 1 on silver, it's not technically correct, but nobody's going to not understand what you're talking about. If you put a 2 on zinc, it's not technically correct, but nobody's going to be confused about what you're talking about. Why remember those couple exceptions? Because you're not going to confuse anybody. If you just say everything in here, I'm going to put a Roman numeral on it. In this particular case, you're already given those Roman numerals, and so we'll have to start from there. This is... Uh, much easier than you would expect, because there's one fewer thing you need to look up on the periodic table. These Roman numerals are the oxidation state, the charge on those transition metals. So if copper is Cu, this right here is telling us it is a 2 plus. And let me just tell you, the number one mistake people make is they think that this Roman numeral is telling you how many of something you have, or a charge on the anion. No. This and this go together every single time. So copper is a 2 plus, iodine group 17, 1 minus. When we crisscross and reduce those, 2 is going down, 1 over there, and you end up with CuI2. The reason these Roman numerals matter is because things in the transition metal area can have multiple oxidation states, and it has to do with how the S sublevel and the D sublevel fill. Not important for right now, but what is important is recognizing these Roman numerals are important because they're telling you a specific oxidation state for, in this case, copper, which is going to tell you a totally different compound in this case. So if copper, in this case, is a 1 plus, and we already know iodine is a 1 minus, iodide, when we crisscross and reduce, we're going to get CuI, a totally different compound. And it's really important that we distinguish these things, or at least that our nomenclature system has a way to distinguish these things, uh, because otherwise it's kind of pointless, right? So anyway, I did another example here with iron and tin and lead, but the two irons is another very common example. So iron, and again, this right here is saying iron, Fe, with a 2+. plus. This is saying Fe with a 3+. plus. And then we have our oxygen on there. Oxygen's a 2-, minus. oxygen is still a 2-. minus. When we crisscross and reduce, 2 is going down there, 2 is going down there. We're going to get Fe2O2, but don't forget to reduce FeO. And over here, we're going to have our 2 and our 3, and we do get to keep that one, Fe2O3. I only have one chemistry joke, and it's about how ugly iron oxide is. Uh, anyway. Tin 4 nitrate, same deal. Tin, atomic number 50, chemical symbol SN from Stannis. SN, that's tin. It is a 4 plus here. All right. So take note, that information is there. Nitrate, NO3, 
one minus. We do have to spot those polyatomic ions like we did before. Um, on the last page, I was putting these in with a yellow marker. When we crisscross and reduce, the four is going to go out there, and the one is going to go down there. So you end up with SN. We need our parenthesis. Uh, NO3, four. Four nitrates in that compound. And I do want to mention here, like, if you look at what we would predict, you may notice I put a note on here, predict 2 plus. It's usually 2 plus in here. Statistically speaking, <laughs> it's your best bet. Uh, and that's because everything in here technically has two valence electrons if we're not uh, putting electrons in the D sublevel and stuff. So we would predict 2 plus. So if we were predicting 2 plus for, we had a copper right here, we would not have predicted 1 plus, right? If we had predicted for lead, you know, 4 plus or minus, we actually would have ended up with a 4 plus right there. Tin, SN, same deal. But there's also tin 2 and lead 2 oxides, or oxidation states. So don't trust what's up there. Always look at the one that's more reliable. Or if you're given the Roman numeral, it tells you exactly what you have. The last one there, lead PB, from the Latin plumbus. This is a 4 plus, all right? This goes together. The Roman numeral is the oxidation state on our transition metal. Dichromate Cr2O7, 2 minus. So no matter how scary it looks, cover it up. You can't see it. It's not scary anymore. Something that I have is a 2 minus. Something that I have is a 4 plus. And so I'm just going to crisscross those. Again, I can't see what's right there. I'm going to put my 2 right down there. And then the four, just pretend, cover that back up, four there. And you'll note, we have a two there and a four there, so we can reduce. It's not going to be PB2Cr207, four. We're going to have to reduce to our PBCr207, two. And again, we don't multiply those through. We can't change what's inside of that parentheses. It already has a formula. It already has a name. All we can do is say how many of that thing we have.